He's still the deliverer. I mean, I just, you think about that song, though I have seen the broken times, though I've been at the bottom, though there, it was said that there was no hope, there's always hope in him. There's always hope in him. There's always something new, something better, something more that he wants to do in your life. Amen. What a beautiful message that song has to it. And Carol, thank you for doing such a beautiful job. And, and if you have to escape back to that place, well, <laughs> I never heard of anybody breaking out of rehab and rushing off to church, but <laughs> leave it to Carol, right? Amen. Going to church? Yeah, praise the Lord. Absolutely. I bet you invited him to come with you too, didn't you? I thought. <laughs> That's right. You have to go there on purpose. Um, <laughs> I guess there's a couple of ways you could take that, but um, Carol's brother Richard. Uh, I, I, he's been here a couple of times before now and really doesn't need much of an introduction other than uh, we, we know him, we love him, we appreciate his heart for the Lord, for the gospel, for the truth, the stand that he takes, the work that he does. Um, and uh, he's such a humble man, too. He'll, you know, if I ask him to preach, he'll say, well, you know, well, you know, it's your pulpit and your church and I hate to. And it's like, man, we want you to preach. We want to hear what the Lord is saying to you and through you. And, of course, he keeps up with what's going on here through the, the messages that go out over YouTube in various ways. And um, there's just been a connection that God has created between us that we are so grateful for. And his infinite wisdom, he, is, he has done it, hasn't he? Amen. And he'll keep doing it. Amen? Amen? So if you would, welcome Brother Richard as he comes to share yeah, what the Lord has put on his heart. And look, Ken, he got up all on his own. We've got this one if you want to yeah, wear that. We'll put it on me because I don't. We will do that. I don't, I don't. There it is. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Love Bless you. you. Yes, sir. Amen. I have a few things to say to the church before we get started, Brother Chip. This church, and I've gone to many churches and I've preached to many prisons and Many places. But you're some of the kindest people I ever met. <laughs> you got something special. You don't need to lose it. Because there are a lot of places they don't have this love of God flowing out of them. I want to say thank you, first of all, for all of you that have tended to my sister and her husband. I think... Pastor Jerry would be proud of you, Brother Chet, and this church. I know he would. And then you have given your monies and time. And I think it's nothing but right to tell you where your monies are going. And we have a printing ministry, mainly. And we have books that are verse by verse. We have 50 study books. Brother Ken has written a book called The Pardon. And Carol's husband, Brother Bob, has written The Seven Deadly Deeds. They're along with the 50. And we have tests that go with these printed books. Some of mine are devotional, some of them are verse by verse. But all get a test. And that's how we gauge if they are really reading the literature. And so <clears throat> I want to report to you that this year, at the end of December, we're on track to have 3,000 finished tests, 3,000 certificates of completion. Some of these tests are 12 and 14 pages long. <laughs> so they have to want to do it. It's not just a fold out. The books are thick. And they really want to do it. And at the end of each test, we ask them to give a report of you know, how they feel about it and what's happened in their lives. And I sent some of them to Ken and to Brother Bob. It'll make your tears roll down your cheeks, Brother Chris. I love you, Brother Chris. 
Brother Chris is now on the same team. <laughs> and you think that, you know, sometimes we're so busy we don't realize about those people that are locked up. And they have souls. And they have needs. And maybe they should be there. I'm not saying they shouldn't. For whatever time they were given by the laws of the land. That's not, I don't ever get into that. That's not my deal. That's a judge's deal. My deal is to uplift the name of Jesus. And your money supplying books and offerings. Go for the mailing. Each one of those books costs $4.16 to mail them. So we've mailed out over 3,000. And we have over 477 new students every year. It has to be renewed. You know, some are getting through and some are getting out. And we have many that tell us they want to take the courses even after they get out. So Brother Chet and Jesus Reign Fellowship, everywhere we go, every book we send out, Everything we lift up the name of Jesus, you are right there with me. And I want to say thank you to every one of you. Now, I have one other word to say, and I realize this. Brother Josh, you'll never be the same, son. <laughs> but it's good change, good change. Uh, God made a woman, and God made a man, and that's a good thing. I want to say one other thing. I've been to a lot of places also, and this music group you have, all of you listen up that are musical and inclined and staying up here. Thank you. Thank the Lord that he's worked in your heart to want to lift your hands and praise God. You'll never be sorry for praising God as you do. You've got a great group, brother. And I appreciate each and every one of you. Amen? Amen? Now let's study the Word a little bit. Let's turn to Deuteronomy. I'm going to go to two verses in the Word of God. <clears throat> I know it's kind of strange that many churches, they, the people don't even have their Bibles. So I say, let's open up our Bibles. And they say, <laughs> they smile at me. Well, I've got these memorized if you didn't bring your Bible. In the book of Deuteronomy, <clears throat> I want us to look in chapter, I believe it's 17. Yes, I've got to get these specs on, I'm sorry. Well, maybe I will and maybe I won't. Mother, I may have to have my other ones. Yeah, well, I'm going to read it anyway. In chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, and verse 6, <clears throat> At the mouth of two witnesses, or three, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. And Matthew 18, verse 16, it says, In the mouth of two or three, let every word be established. This is a principle of God. I've titled this message, The Power of Two. The Power of Two. Brother Chet brought a message, <clears throat> those of you that were here, October the 16th. God is waiting on me, if I've got it correct. I listen to your service, or at least to his preaching, uh, every week. Brother Ken sends it to me. And I, I listen, and I'm studying, and I'm right there at my computer, and I do a lot of work on computers. And, and that thing started, li I started hearing something, and it started pricking my ear. I said, I better stop and listen to this. And I did. This message this morning is a result of that. God spoke to me, pierced my heart. You know, God <clears throat> is the author of all the numeric system. And God is absolute. And so God's numeric system 
of numbers. It's also absolute. 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 Get it right in a minute. And so the number two is what we want to talk about today. You all know about six, the number of man, and seven, the number of completion. I think it's used 54 times in the book of Revelation alone. The number eight, the new beginning. Well, number two is the number of witness in the Word of God. And I think it's used, I looked this up, don't have it memorized, 853 times. God uses the number two. In creation, He had the sun and the moon, male and female, action and reaction. In religion, he has the Old Testament, the New Testament. He has the temple, the church. He said where two would come to agreement on anything in Matthew 18 and 19, God would give us that. Where two or more meet together in his name, he said, I'll be in your midst. So God uses two. You can look it up sometime. It's interesting. The power of two. But the question comes, how do I fit in the numeric system of God? How do I fit in the numeric system of God? Now I begin to think about that, and the only way that I feel that we are, maybe can understand it, is in the body of Christ, the church. The church has two parts, and it is the head and the body, amen? Amen. Christ is the head and we the members are the body and those that have been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ, they are His body. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12 and 13. And so I begin to think about us being in the house of God. And the Bible says that the house of God is the habitation of God through the Spirit. Ephesians 2, 20 and 22. 1 Timothy 3 and 15, I believe, says that the house of God is the church of the living God. Hebrews said we are the city of the living God. And I thought about what is really the mission and purpose of the house of God, of Jesus Christ. One is do what we did this morning, praise and worship God. Amen. He is due all our praises. And another one is that I believe that on the day of Pentecost, or before it happened, in Acts 1 and 8, he said, And you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses. And I thought about that for a moment. What kind of witness am I in the house of God? As Many members, but one body. The unity of the body. What kind of influence am I having in my sphere, in my area, where I live? Where I work, where I play? And I begin to think about that the house of God is, again, too, a depository of what? Of power and of wisdom. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24 that Jesus Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now I begin to think about, do I really believe that the power of God lives in me? Do I really believe that the wisdom of God dwells in me? Do I know what to do, how to do? Do I have the power to do what I need to do as a witness for Jesus Christ? And absolutely, we do. The Bible teaches we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of God. That's 1 Corinthians 3.16 now. I've got the Bible. If you want the Bible, I'll give you the Bible. And we go, if we had time, we'd read them all. But read chapter 6 and verse 19 and 20. We are the temple of God. So I got to think the power is there and the wisdom is there to, to know what to do. Well, why aren't we doing it? You know, the house of God, we are to be warriors, whether you know it or not. 
Turn with me to 2 Timothy just a moment. I hope I slow down. I may not get through this message, but when I close, if you'll follow me, and if you'll stay with me, if God is leading this message, He's going to speak to somebody, in my opinion, my belief. You're going to come to a crossroads in your life before you leave here today. I believe that. That's what he's put on my heart. To try to get that over to you. Where you can fully understand what's happening. What are the choices? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as what? A good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now notice this. No man that warreth entertangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. Had you ever considered that you are a soldier of Jesus Christ? Have you ever considered that you've been given a mandate by Christ that you might be able to do for God, to stand for God, to fight for God, and war against even the old man that lives within you. You know, we're not only fighting those enemies of the cross. And by the way, our weapons are what? Not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Amen? At 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, you need to know the Word of God. I mean, we can have emotional highs and emotional lows. And the reason people of God today seem to be so despondent is because they don't know the foundation that they stand on. I mean, how can you know that I'm supposed to be doing this or that if I don't even know the foundation that I'm supposed to be on? And so we know we're to be witnesses. Amen? That's proven. We know that Paul said we're to be clothed with the armor of God and he uses the soldier's army, the Roman soldier in Ephesians chapter 6. And so if we are armored up with God, we have the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. If we've involved ourselves in learning the Word of God and building on that foundation, then we've been given the power to accomplish it. I don't think there's any doubt in it that we have the power. If you're born again, you have the power living within you. Somebody said, well, why worry about it? Let's just go status quo. I want to share with you, brothers and sisters, I believe that this nation is on the verge of complete moral decay. In all the years I've lived, I've never seen like it is today that sin is no longer sin. And law and order is just, where is it? Who respects the law and the order of it anymore? I see little clips on the news program at night. Crime is rampant in our major cities and even in lesser cities. They're just going in and knocking old women down at the subway in New York, stomping their face until they're unconscious. They're going into jewelry stores and just robbing and looting and walking out and laughing about it. It seems to me that, that drugs are even, they're robbing us of the next generation. I deal with it all the time. I see it every day. You just only hear about it maybe, but Chris and I hear about it and see it every day, what it does to a young body, a young lady or a young man. Wrecks their bodies. And I begin to think more and more when I, I listen to some of them say, they say, who is God? I say, how old are you? Where have you lived? Where have you been, sir? I'm talking about inmates in prison. Well, I, you know, I was born over here. I'm 21 years old. And uh, I, I never heard anything about God. Well, the problem to me is the home. The problem, is you, you find it in the churches, in the pulpit, Brother Chet. Amen. 
We have got, I know this is not a fancy message, by the way, but it's what God put on my heart. We that stand behind this death, a desk are obligated to teach the truth of God. We're to lay line upon line and precept upon precept. So the young ones coming up, they will hear it. They may not, it may not be effectual to them at that time, but they're hearing and the seed is being sown in their heart. I thought about abortion. It's not murder anymore. I don't mean to be nasty or ugly to anyone. But folks, we need to wake up. We need to wake up. How many people have been murdered in the womb? 63 million people in the United States alone. What, What about worldwide? Millions. And we think about I think about leisure and pleasure seem to be what everybody strives for. They only work three days a week and off four now. And I can just go on and on with this, but i got to say this. The darkness of our educational system now, Mom and Daddies, you need to wake up what is being preached and taught in our schools today, in our public schools. I mean... As far as I know, a male is male and a female is a female. Amen? I don't have any problem with that. Brother Josh has been married many years, son. And I have never had any problem identifying my wife. Now, a lot of people don't like that. I understand. I'm telling you what I feel like. Ladies, be ladies. You are a lady. You are a woman. And God has ordained those women and men. That's what He's ordained. He's ordained marriage. Marriage today is looked on as disdain. Man, we don't need to be married. I'm not saying a a license from the state marries you, but I'm saying if you stand up in front of a body of Christ like this, this is the woman I want to marry. This is the man I want to marry. There is a witness before God that I'm taking this woman on and she's taking me on and we're one. That's the witness. I look at religion and it seems like they, it just has a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And what they've done is they've degraded God down to the level of man and man is just as important as God and that's not so. God is in charge. I, I want to tell you. <laughs> You didn't get here by yourself. Amen? And so when I think about these things, I say, what is going on in our life? I mean, when I hear most gospel preachers on YouTube or whatever it is, it's like a social gospel. I don't know what kind of gospel you would call it. Jesus is to be preached. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, I preached Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You see that? And that's all Paul knew was to lift up the name of Jesus. And all of the truths that you find in his 14 books. Yes, I believe he wrote Hebrews. In his 14 books in the New Testament. So the question comes, what can I do, preacher? I'm just one person. What can I do? I want to relate a story to you about two men and a stick. Are you with me? Two men and one stick. You know where I'm going? To Exodus chapter 3. There we have the story of Moses and Aaron and the rod of God. And so to answer your question, what can you do? Moses said, Lord, I'm slow of speech. I can't do this. Now, he just seen the burning bush, okay, that was not consumed. I'd think if I saw a burning bush, I would think God was up to something. Don't you? God told him, he said, Moses, you're going to be the one that's going to deliver my people Israel out of bondage. They've been there 400 years. Well, they've been there 430, but 400 of it, they were in bondage. 
terrible labor under the Pharaoh of Egypt at that time. Moses and Aaron were prepared by God, sent by God, empowered by God. Gave him three signs, you remember? Water turning into blood. Put the hand in, come out leprous, put it back in. Bring it out, it's healed. You remember that? His rod was thrown down. It ate up the snakes of the magicians. You you remember those three signs? One man and a rod defeated a global power. One man and a stick defeated Pharaoh's country, Egypt. Economically, it was destroyed by the plagues, the ten plagues. Financially, it was destroyed, and militarily, it was destroyed at the Red Sea. All but the rod. Now, what I'm trying to say is that the rod is the power of God, the wisdom of God, the spirit of God. You see? The witness were the the signs that he gave Moses. And so you say, well, I don't know. Do I have those things? Look, let's learn some lessons from the, the two men in the stick. Not only did he do those plagues with the rod, but there was the Red Sea. You remember he opened the Red Sea and they walked through on dry ground. You remember that? He also hit a rock and what came out? Now, keep this in mind. You say, what can I do? I ask you again, are you a member of the body of Christ? I ask you again, do you really know that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you? Let's learn some lessons. First of all, folks, this is God's story. It's not yours. I learned a long time ago to surrender to the sovereignty of God. I couldn't change it. I couldn't change my height. I couldn't change my no hair. I couldn't change this or that. God made me how he made me. We each one, each one of us are unique, but God did it. It's God's story, it's God's plan, and it's God's preparations. He prepared Moses. I didn't. Moses didn't even prepare himself. He tried to do it when he was down in Egypt, land, killed those Egyptians, and had to flee. He was 80 years old now when God dealt with him. But in the desert, 40 years, sheep herd to the burning bush. God prepared Aaron, the mouth, for Moses. He said, Moses, you'll be a God to Aaron. Aaron, you'll be a mouthpiece for Moses. You mean I'm supposed to go before Pharaoh, the greatest ruler of that day of all the earth, and I'm going to say, let my people go. Who in the world am I going to say sent me? Tell them I am sent you. Tell them the great I am that I am has sent you. That's your authority in the Word of God. The house of God is God's house. He is the authority and He is the power. So why do we shake it in our boots, see, when we need to move for God? God equips His servants. You say, well, I don't believe I have any talents. Wait a minute now. If you read the Word of God, 1 Corinthians 12 says there are diversity of gifts. At differences of administrations, right? And diversity of operations. Oh, yes, you have some gifts. The gifts and calling are without repentance. Romans 11, 29. <laughs> you didn't work for them. You didn't design it. You didn't study for it. God in His omnipotence and His omniscience, He gave you gifts. Amen? That you might be a witness. Remember two men in the stick. Power of two. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The power of two living within you. Now, I I don't know where you are today. I have no idea. But you ought to have some confidence. When you read these old stories, you should have confidence. It should build you up in the most holy faith that I too can do it for God. Where are we? 
Well, number one, our nation's in trouble. It's a fact. Number two, our churches are powerless. I travel all, I travel a lot of places. And I don't mean anything against the singers, I loved them. But you know, we can, we can rejoice at that. And we do. But see, we can sit in our seat and do that. <laughs> right? Hey, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb. But now when I leave that door, what am I going to do? God, you said, was waiting on me. The problem is not God. I guess what I want to say is, where are the Joshuas? Where are the Joshuas? He wrote. Moses wrote it down. Joshua wrote it down. In 2415, he said, As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Am I too loud? I'll turn this thing off. I will serve the Lord. He didn't back up. You mama and daddy's listen to me. It's going to pay off. You need to take control of your homes, in my opinion. You need to turn TikTok off. Or you need to set limits or bounds where these young children are not. Look, I was watching the news yesterday or day before. And the man in the White House had a man dressed up like a woman come and spend all day in his office. See, these kids, they're growing up not knowing the difference anymore. And, and I tell you, folks, I believe it's serious that we need Joshua's in the house of God to say, as for me and my house, it is your house. You are responsible, men, for what you do in your house and what happens in your house. Where are, the, where are the Daniels? Where are the three Hebrew boys that they threw in the fire and they said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to say one thing to you, God is able. Now, my translation, I don't know what God's going to do, but I can tell you one thing I do know, I'm not going to bow down to your golden image. There comes a time that even our young people there's no respect for the older people because they don't see the difference in them. We need to set the standard. We need to set the standard in our homes and teach our children. Look, folks, they're going to be running this place pretty soon. And what are they going to do? Where are they going to go? To whom do you look to? But Christ, it's not the young people's fault. It's the daddies and the mamas, the preachers that won't preach the word, that won't stand the word. They, nobody wants to be any kind of resistance whatsoever, none. We don't want any resistance. We don't want any change. We want to be just like the world is. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you're in the body of Christ, you're not like the world. You're not like the world. So where are the Joshua's? Where are the three Hebrew boys? Where are the Daniels? I'm going to ask you to do something for me in your heart. I'm getting ready to quit. I'm going to ask you in your heart, if, it's, if you really think that God is speaking to you today. I don't usually preach this slow. I'm sorry, but it's, it's on me to ask you this. Are you willing to face who you really are. Yeah. Can you say, I am not walking by faith. I'm walking, but I'm not really following the Lord Jesus Christ because that's too narrow. That's too close quarters. I can't do that. The world won't put up with it. My employer will fire me if I walk after Christ, get fired. 
He holds all the gold in the hills, all the cattle on the hills, and all the food anywhere in this world. Just one little breath of God and this whole earth would be an iceberg. All he has to do is move the sun out of its circuit just a few degrees and this earth would freeze. All he has to do is turn off the water spigot and your crops will not grow. Amen? All he has to do is just take your breath. Have you ever lost your breath? When I play football, it hit me in the stomach and it take my breath and I think I'm going to die. I wasn't about to die. They'd come pull me on my belt and pull you up like that. They don't do the pamper them like they do now, but they'd just kick your butt and get on out in there. <laughs> get on back in there. You're all right. I wonder if we could say, I'm really not depending on any of the promises either, God. Really, God, I don't know about these promise deals. I, I don't know about this. I hear these people get up and make these testimonies, but I don't know, God, about these promises now. I'd like to share one thing with you. They are true. I've been to the bottom, and I've been on top. The same promises brought me through the slop as well I rejoiced on the mountaintop, I'll tell you. Well, I, I don't know, preacher. I, really, I have never, ever crossed Jordan. I just want to admit to you today and to God, I just really, I'm on this side in the wilderness. Do you all know what I'm talking about? You have read the story of the 40 years of the wilderness journey. Amen. And when it came time to leave, you know who left? Joshua and Caleb and those 19 years and younger that had been born in that wilderness journey. I really like it over here. Well, let's just see if you do. Not only do I admit what I'm not, but I want to admit to myself today that really I'm living a defeated life. I don't really have the peace that the preacher talks about. I don't really have that power that he talks about. Where is my joy really most of the time? Well, if I had a good meal, you know, I feel pretty good. Or if company came over or whatever, went to a ball game, I did this. It's just up and down. I want, to, I want us to admit that we really are just full of doubt most of the time, even fear. I'm selfish. I'm going to tell you now, that I'm hitting home here. Ken talks about it all the time. I really don't give a hoot about what you think. I'm not forgiving you of nothing. Look, I'm on my own. That's how we feel. I'm running this deal, and you're not running me. Y'all can look at me funny if you want to, but I'm, you're just like me. There was a time I didn't, I didn't care. I was sniffing the wind. <laughs> didn't matter what they thought. But see, that's not the child of God. That's not the love of God permeating you. You follow me? I wonder how many secretly today would make this commitment. You don't have to tell me. I'm nothing. God, I want to follow you. I'm going to commit, God, to follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. Wherever He leads, wherever He goes, I'm following Him. It doesn't matter about anything else. I'm going to put it behind me. Now, now that's a big step. Did you hear me? I'm going to follow the Lamb. I was sitting in a pew when they sang, Wherever He leads me, I will go. Some of you may have never heard that old song. It kept pulling in my heartstrings, and I kept saying, God, I can't do that. I can't go. I can't do that. He said, think about the two men in one stick. Do I live in you? I said, yes, sir, you do. I mean, I remember like it was yesterday. And I called, just kept getting greater and greater and greater to finally I succumbed to it. I couldn't help it. God had a plan for my life. God has a plan for your life. Now you may never succumb to that peace and that power and that joy that God has for you, but He has it for you. 
And I'm wondering sometime if we could just say, Lord, I want you to take control of my body and my soul and my spirit. I want you to take all of me. I used to say, well, I tell you what, God, I'll do some things. I'll tell somebody about Jesus, but that's all I'm going to do. And I'm not going to do that every day. But he wants my body. He wants my soul. He wants my spirit. He wants all of me. But the last thing that really got me was when I said, God, you can rule my house. I didn't like that. I was the boss in that house. And what went on was because it went on because of me. But what I needed to do is do those things that God told me to do. See, he saw the pitfalls. He could see past my little thinker. So I'm just asking you, and I'm going to put it this way. I said it to you last time I was here. Will I surrender to the sovereignty of God that I'm who I am? I'm where I am. Will I submit to the will of God for my life? Will I do that? Will I obey the word of God for my life that He tells me? And will I endure in the same? Would you stand, please? If you like. I don't know if it spoke to you or not. Brother Chet, he preached a long time on God is waiting on me. And I just kind of built on that message, trying to get you to think and trying to get you to examine your life and to see where you really stand with God. And I guess the final thing is, do you really know who's running your life? Are you running it or is God running it? That's what you got to know. I'm going to pray this prayer. And, and I don't know whether you want to repeat after me or not. Because if you do, you're making a vow with God. You're saying, God, I'm ready to make this change today. You're going to leave here in a minute, and you're going to make some kind of decision, I promise you. Either you're going to say, that old man's a lunatic, and he's way out of bounds, or I'm being convicted by God, I'm being drawn by God. Somebody says, well, it's not affecting me. Yeah, but it may be somebody it is. So let's pray. Father, I want you to take my life, God. I want you to rule and reign in my heart. Father, I have sins of the flesh that I've not confessed. And Lord, I'm sorry. And I ask you to forgive me and you promised you would. Lord, I'm asking you to take my family, to take my children, to take my work, to take my money, to take everything I've got. And may it be used in your hands for the glory and honor of God. Father, I commit today to you that I'm going to follow you and follow your word. Father, I commit today that I'm going to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I commit to you today, Father, that I'm not going to turn to the left or to the right. For when I talk, it will be your words. When I walk, it will be your way. And the things I do, God, will be because that's what you told me to do in the word. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to close with this. I don't know. Yes, sir. I don't know how many made any kind of commitment whatsoever. But listen to me. If you truly made a commitment, I'm talking to you young people too, start now. Don't let it get on you. Don't let the stripes be on you, please. Those rough edges are hard to file away. Broken pieces are hard to put back together. But I'm telling you, if you made a commitment and you meant it and you were sincere with God today, and when you prayed that prayer, you were saying, God, take complete control of me. That, right now, God, I'm going to leave here a different person. Let me, let me share something with you. Your peace and your joy and your power is going to come upon you like you've never experienced before. Do you remember the hour you first believed? 
Somebody said, what are you talking about? The hour you first the burden rolled away of your sin debt. Oh, I tell you, it got bright. <laughs> I, I was a young man, but I was a sinner. <laughs> Saved by the grace of God, and I knew it. I knew a change had come. I mean, I was excited. <laughs> I mean, I was telling people at the gas pump, and I filled up with a the car. They didn't know what in the world I was talking about. I said, I've been changed. Hallelujah, I've been changed. I'm not what I used to be. And they'd look at me and say, have you changed clothes or what? I said, no, in here. I've never been the same. I've made many mistakes. When you made that commitment a moment ago, I promise you, it's going to clear up. The clouds are going to clear away just like that. And you'll be saying, God, where do we go next? You'll go home and you'll tell your wife. You'll tell your children, gather them around you. No, y'all are not too old, sweeties. You just gather them around you and say, honey, look, your daddy's been a mess. I've led you the wrong way. But from this day forward, I'm serving Jesus Christ in this house. It may be too late for some. They say, daddy, I'm not going that way. See you later. Well, that's just something you're going to have to bear. But you still got little ones coming up. We got a witness even in here, all of us, we have witnesses, one witness one to another. We go out on our job, we have a witness. Look, you're getting ready to have a change. Look, do you, which one sings about the chains falling off? Who sang? Look, Travis. Somewhere back in the back, I guess. Look, friend, you're talking about chains falling off. You say, I've had this problem, I just can't lick it. I like to look at women. Well, you're normal, I guess, but you can conquer that. Well, I just got a little computer, and I look a little, I look at this stuff on there. Uh, I think it's pornography. Yeah, that's what it is. Say it. That's what it is. Well, I just look at it a little bit. Don't look at it at all because you are flesh, still walking around in flesh, and you keep skirting with it, and you keep bouncing around with it, it's going to bite you. And I could go on like this forever, but you're getting ready for a real change in your life. And you talk about a witness. You'll go help the sick. You won't bother you. You'll take money out of your pocket, book. I've always said, just follow the money. All you have to do is just follow this little wallet right here. You'll find out where their heart is. I've been doing this a long time. I've watched people and they get up and they praise God and fall on the floor and all this stuff. But you follow that money. You see how they act at work. You see how they act at school. When I went to the university, I was an oddball. My dad is a preacher and I didn't even know what a picture show was because we weren't allowed to go. And somebody would start talking about this and that after that. I said, well, I don't even know who you're talking about. Somebody asked me if I knew who George Jones was. Well, I didn't know who George Jones was. That's the way I know that's years ago, but that's how ignorant I was. There's nothing wrong with not knowing who George Jones is. There's nothing wrong with not knowing uh, this actor and that actor that hates God. There's nothing wrong with that. Be pure to the Lord, young people. You've got your whole life. Don't do like some of us have done and really let God down. Thank God for His mercy. Hallelujah. I don't know where you stand today, but be blessed. Thank you for listening to me. Be blessed. You're dismissed. Amen. Amen. Brother Chet, do you want to sing us a song or anything? Or no? Okay. Okay, well, you're dismissed, and thank you very much.